MKUltra. MKUltra was one of the most secretive and controversial programs in American history. Launched by the CIA in the early 1950s, it was designed to explore the possibilities of controlling the human mind. Officials feared that the Soviet Union and China were developing their own psychological warfare capabilities, and the US wanted to be ahead in what they called the mind race. The program operated in extreme secrecy. Through a network of front organizations, the CIA funded research in universities, hospitals, prisons, and military facilities across the country and abroad. The methods ranged from the scientific to the disturbing. High doses of LSD administered to unwitting subjects, prolonged sensory deprivation, hypnosis, electroshock therapy, and exposure to psychological stress designed to break mental resistance. Many of the experiments took place without the consent or even the knowledge of the participants. One infamous subproject, Operation Midnight Climax, set up CIA-run safe houses disguised as brothels. The agency observed men through one-way mirrors while slipping hallucinogens into their drinks, studying their reactions in a controlled environment. By the mid-1970s, public investigations revealed fragments of MKUltra's operations, but much of the record had already been destroyed. Officially, the program was shut down in 1973, but its legacy remains a dark example of how far governments will go in pursuit of control. Dead Hand Dead Hand, known in Russian as Perimeter, was the Soviet Union's ultimate safeguard against a surprise nuclear strike. Developed in the early 1980s at the height of Cold War tension, it was designed as an automated doomsday system. A machine that could ensure total retaliation even if the country's leadership was wiped out in a first strike. The system was built to detect the unmistakable signs of a nuclear attack. Seismic shocks from missile impacts, sudden spikes in radiation, extreme atmospheric pressure changes, and the loss of communication with command centers. If these conditions were met, Dead Hand would activate a network of command missiles capable of transmitting launch orders directly to the Soviet strategic forces, bypassing human approval entirely. This meant that even in the event of complete destruction of the Kremlin and military leadership, the Soviet arsenal could still be unleashed, guaranteeing what strategists called mutually assured destruction. For decades, the existence of Dead Hand was denied, dismissed as Western speculation. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, former officers confirmed that the system had been real and that elements of it may still remain operational in some form. Tsar Bomba Tsar Bomba was the Soviet Union's ultimate display of nuclear might, the largest and most powerful bomb ever detonated in human history. Officially designated RDS-220, it was designed during the early 1960s under the leadership of physicist Andrei Sakharov. The weapon was intended as a statement to the world, a demonstration that the USSR could unleash destruction on an unimaginable scale. The bomb weighed over 27 metric tons and was so massive that the 295 bomber carrying it had to be modified just to fit it inside. On October 30th, 1961, Tsar Bomba was dropped over the remote Novaya Zemlya archipelago in the Arctic. To reduce fallout, the design was modified from its original 100 megaton capacity to a still staggering 50 megatons, more than 3,000 times the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. When it detonated, the fireball stretched nearly 8 kilometers wide. The shockwave traveled around the Earth three times, shattering windows over 900 kilometers away. The mushroom cloud rose into the stratosphere, towering 64 kilometers high. Even at its reduced yield, the explosion was so powerful that no practical military target could justify its use. Tsar Bomba's destructive force made it both a technological triumph and a symbol of the Cold War's madness. A reminder that the race for nuclear supremacy was driven as much by political theater as by military necessity. Project A-119 Project A-119 was one of the Cold War's most audacious and bizarre proposals, a secret U.S. Air Force plan to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon. Conceived in 1958, at the dawn of the space race, the project was designed not as a weapon of war, but as a spectacle. American military planners feared that the Soviet Union's early space achievements, including the launch of Sputnik, were tipping the balance of global prestige. A nuclear explosion on the moon, visible from Earth, would be an unmistakable show of American dominance in science, technology, and raw power. The plan called for a small, lightweight nuclear warhead to be launched aboard a modified missile, 
time to detonate on the moon's surface in such a way that the flash and resulting dust plume would be visible to observers on Earth. Scientists calculated the blast would have no lasting effect on the moon's orbit or surface stability, but its psychological impact on the world could be enormous. Physicist Leonard Reifel, who led the study, later revealed that a young Carl Sagan had worked on the project, tasked with modeling how lunar dust would disperse in the moon's low gravity. The plan was ultimately abandoned in 1959, partly due to fears that the public would react with outrage, and partly because the risks of a launch failure were too great. Project Azorian Project Azorian was one of the most ambitious covert operations of the Cold War, a CIA mission to recover a sunken Soviet ballistic missile submarine from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. In March 1968, the Soviet submarine K-129 vanished while on patrol northwest of Hawaii, sinking to a depth of over 16,000 feet. The Soviet Navy searched extensively but failed to locate the wreck. The United States, however, found it using deep-sea surveillance, and the CIA saw an opportunity to capture not just the vessel, but its nuclear missiles, cryptographic materials, and intelligence on Soviet naval technology. The problem was how to lift a 2,000-ton submarine from such extreme depths without alerting the Soviets. The solution came in the form of a massive, custom-built recovery ship the Hughes Glomar Explorer. Publicly, it was presented as a deep-sea mining vessel funded by billionaire Howard Hughes to harvest manganese nodules from the ocean floor. Secretly, it concealed a giant mechanical claw designed to grasp and raise the wreck. In the summer of 1974, the Glomar Explorer reached the site and began the painstaking recovery. The operation was only partially successful, during the lift, much of the submarine broke apart, and only a section was brought to the surface. Inside were two nuclear torpedoes and the bodies of six Soviet sailors, who were given a formal burial at sea with full military honors. The mission remained classified for years until leaked to the press in 1975. Operation Ivy Bells Operation Ivy Bells was a joint U.S. Navy and NSA mission that pushed Cold War espionage into one of the most inaccessible battlegrounds, the ocean floor. In the early 1970s, American intelligence discovered that the Soviet Navy relied on undersea communication cables to transmit sensitive military messages between bases on the Kamchatka Peninsula and the Soviet Pacific Fleet headquarters in Vladivostok. These cables were laid along the seabed in Soviet territorial waters, where they were assumed to be safe from interception. The mission was simple in theory, but dangerous in execution. They had to reach the cables, tap them, and record everything without detection. The submarine USS Halibut, specially modified for deep sea surveillance, was sent into Soviet waters under strict radio silence. Navigating treacherous icy depths, the crew located the cables and attached a sophisticated recording device that could capture weeks of conversations without disrupting the signal. Every month, U.S. divers returned to retrieve the tapes and replace the power supply. The operation yielded an unprecedented stream of high-value intelligence, including unencrypted discussions about Soviet naval operations, weapon systems, and command protocols. For nearly a decade, the TAP remained undiscovered. Its success ended abruptly in the early 1980s when Ronald Pelton, a former NSA employee, sold the secret to the Soviets. The cable was pulled from the seabed, and Ivy Bells was terminated. Even though it was compromised, Operation Ivy Bells is still remembered as one of the most daring and technically challenging espionage feats of the Cold War. Operation Paperclip Operation Paperclip was one of the most morally complex undertakings of the early Cold War. A secret U.S. program to recruit former Nazi scientists, engineers, and technicians after the fall of the Third Reich. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union were racing to secure Germany's most advanced technology and the mines that created it. From rocketry to aeronautics to chemical weapons, these men possessed knowledge that could tip the balance of power for decades to come. The U.S. Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, operating under the newly formed Department of Defense, identified hundreds of German specialists to bring to America. Many had been members of the Nazi Party, some even holding senior positions in Hitler's war machine. Their wartime activities included work on the V-2 rocket program, technology that had rained destruction on London but would later form the foundation of the U.S. space program. 
Under paperclip, the scientists were quietly relocated to the United States, their records sanitized to hide their Nazi affiliations from the public. The most famous recruit was Werner von Braun, who became the chief architect of the Saturn V rocket that carried Apollo astronauts to the moon. Others contributed to ballistic missile development, military aircraft design, and advanced weapons research. Operation Chrome Dome Operation Chrome Dome was one of the most intense and dangerous missions of the Cold War, a U.S. Air Force strategy to keep nuclear-armed bombers in the air at all times, ready to strike the Soviet Union at a moment's notice. Beginning in 1960, at the height of nuclear tension, Strategic Air Command launched fleets of B-52 Stratofortress bombers on continuous rotation, each carrying multiple thermonuclear weapons. The logic was simple but grim. If the Soviets destroyed U.S. airbases in a first strike, these airborne bombers would still be able to deliver immediate retaliation. Every day, the massive aircraft flew long, looping routes over the Arctic, the Atlantic, and near Soviet airspace, never landing until another bomber took its place. The missions were exhausting for crews, lasting up to 24 hours, and carried immense risk. A single accident could mean disaster, and accidents did happen. In 1966, a B-52 collided with a refueling tanker over Spain, dropping four hydrogen bombs. None detonated, but two released radioactive contamination. Two years later, another B-52 crashed in Greenland, scattering nuclear debris across the ice. Each incident sparked international outrage, but the operation continued for years, with the understanding that any pause in airborne readiness could leave the United States vulnerable. Operation Chrome Dome was eventually phased out in 1968, replaced by faster response missile systems. But during its run, it symbolized the Cold War's constant state of alert, a world where every hour of every day, nuclear war was only minutes away. Thank you very much for watching this video, and if you learned something, make sure to leave a like. Subscribe if you would like to see similar videos. Thank you again, and goodbye.